This is podcast number 36 in my series, Colonies to Colossus, The Rise of a Giant. In my last podcast, we looked at the French and Indian War. In this podcast, we're going to take a look at young George Washington's part in that war. We often think of George Washington as the stern elder statesman depicted in our $1 bills. We remember him as the first president or as the commander in chief of the Continental Army. But there was a time when Washington was young, inexperienced, and even reckless. During the French and Indian War, a war that Washington provided the spark to ignite, he was an inexperienced officer in the Virginia militia. His responsibilities required him to live like an Indian sometimes. We don't often picture him wearing Indian clothes and trekking through frozen, rugged forests or paddling canoes down icy rivers, but that is what he did. He became quite a frontiersman. It was a perilous time in his life, but it was also a great adventure. It prepared him well for his future as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army and as one of the writers of the Constitution and as the first President of the United States. On the screen right now is shown a portion of the Ohio country in which the French and Indian War started. I've put the modern boundaries of Pennsylvania, the state of Pennsylvania, there in red so you can get an idea for reference where this is at. At this time, what is today western Pennsylvania was considered part of Virginia. That's why Virginia is so involved in it. In my last podcast, I talked about how the French had started to move into this area. The British claimed it, and this kind of set the stage for a conflict because the French were building forts to try and occupy the region. In Virginia, a group of wealthy investors had put together the Ohio Company of Virginia. In fact, George Washington's older brother, Lawrence, who is now deceased at this point, had also been one of those investors. And they had been granted a certain amount of acres by the king, And in return, they promised to bring families into the region and settle the region, and they could have made a lot of money if they'd been able to carry this scheme out. But as the French began to encroach, upset their plans. The Ohio Company wisely gave the governor of Virginia a certain percentage of ownership in the company, and this gave him an incentive also to work with the company to want to dislodge the French and to certainly make sure that the area was regarded as under British control. In 1753, young Washington goes to the governor of Virginia, and he's made a major or commissioned a major in the Virginia militia by the governor. And his first assignment is to take a message to the French at Fort LeBeouf. You can see it there, kind of towards the top of the screen, to tell the French to vacate the area that it's British controlled and they shouldn't be encroaching on it. Back then, becoming an officer in either the British Army, regular British Army, or in the, in the militias of one of the colonies had nothing to do with your qualifications or your training. In fact, there was no training. Washington had no training at all in the military arts, but it had more to do with your social standing. And so Washington being born kind of near towards the upper crust of Virginia society and also being related by marriage, his brother Lawrence had married into the Fairfax family, which was one of the most powerful, influential families in Virginia. So Washington's close enough to that that he can get this commission. Plus, he has some experience. The Fairfaxes had hired him to survey their lands, or he was part of a surveying party to survey lands that they owned out west. So he had some experience in the Virginia backcountry. So it was his social connections and, to some degree, his experience in the backcountry that made the governor give him this commission as as a major in the militia. In his journal, Washington writes, On Wednesday, the 31st of October, 1753, I was commissioned and appointed by the Honorable Robert Dinwiddie, Esquire, Governor of Virginia, to visit and deliver a letter to the Commandant of the French forces on the Ohio and set out on the intended journey the same day. The message that Washington was bringing from Governor Dinwiddie to the French Commandant was sealed in a heavy wax envelope, which was a good thing because Washington was certainly going to get wet during this journey. Accompanying Washington, he had a small entourage, some Indian scouts, a horse handler. He had some baggage with him and an interpreter. He also had someone that was knowledgeable about Indians and their lifestyles, Christopher Gist, who would turn out to be a very important part of this mission. On the screen, you can see the green line that goes up from, I started in Alexandria. It really would have started further south at Williamsburg, the colonial capital. But from Alexandria, the green line goes up and you can see it going up through a number of settlements and places like Logstown and Venango, Shanapins. These are all Indian towns. And Washington's destination is Fort LeBeouf, where the French commandant is, way up at the north there. Along the way of his journey, Washington will be meeting with Indians, 
and participating in some of their speeches and discussions. And in fact, he actually records some of their speeches in his journal. And the reason for this, he knows, as well as the Virginia authorities, that they need to get Indians on their side. Uh, Most of the Indians are siding with the French. They will. The French are going to buy them with gifts. But he's trying to persuade them. Now, there was one Indian uh, chieftain named the Half King. He does join with Washington. He doesn't like the French. He and his people are committed to helping the British. And he does join Washington's party. If you look near the center of the map, you can see a place called Shanapin's Town, which is located today right near where Pittsburgh is, where modern Pittsburgh is. There was no English settlement at the time there. But this was an Indian town. You can see it's located where the Allegheny and the Monongahela rivers meet, and those two rivers then form the Ohio. This place is called the Forks. It's a critically important place because whoever controls this will control the river system or have the most control over it. Washington arrived there, and overlooking these forks, he comments in his journal about what an important place this would be to build a fort. Now, following the green lineup, Washington finally arrives at Fort LeBeouf on December 11th. Now, try and keep in mind how cold this would be traveling and camping out in a raw wilderness in December and November. So these guys have a pretty hardy constitution. Washington arrives at the fort, gives the French commandant the message And then he sends his men out to look at what the French have. And one of the things that Washington's very curious about or interested in is how many canoes the French have. And he finds, to his dismay, the French have several hundred canoes, birch bark and pine log canoes, already built, and many more under construction. And canoes are critically important for controlling the backcountry because with canoes, you can move up and down river systems pretty quickly. And with this number of canoes, you can transport hundreds of men and supplies pretty quickly anywhere you want. So after trying some tricks to to persuade uh, Washington's Indians to desert him and join their cause, the French finally give Washington his reply to the British, which basically is to pound sand. The French say, hey, we're here to stay. British, you can go somewhere else. So from here, Washington starts a canoe ride down the river there. You can kind of see the contours of it back to Venango from Fort LeBeouf. This is an icy river ride that wasn't very pleasant. Several times you had to get out of the water and carry the canoes through shallow water to get them to the next spot. There's lots of chunks of ice buffeting the canoes. Could not have been a pleasant experience. When they finally arrive at a place called Murdering Town, which was an Indian village, and Washington ominously in his journal calls it Murdering Town, Washington decides he needs to make better time getting back to Virginia and delivering this message from the French. So he decides to take off overland instead of following the same path he brought up. And on the map, you can see that little red line going from Murdering Town down near Shanapin's Town. That traces the route that Washington took. He left the horses and the animals and his party there and took with him Christopher Gist alone. And they headed off across country through an unmarked forest. So they head off through the forest. There's no trail. They're just walking overland. Must have been a rough journey and it's icy and cold and snowing. They run into an Indian who offers to escort them. Turns out the Indian was there actually to kill them because later on in their journey, he does try to shoot them. And Washington and Gist force the Indian to go with them because they didn't want him running back and telling friends. And they get kind of nervous because they can't stop and rest because they know they might be killed while they're sleeping. So they have to keep moving and they travel for 36 straight hours. And this Indian guide keeps telling them, according to Gist's journal, that there were Ottawa Indians in the woods who would kill and scalp them if they found them. Talking about Washington, Gist wrote in his journal, The Major's feet grew very sore, and he was very weary. The Major desired to encamp. When they get to the Allegheny River, they need to cross it, so they kind of build this crude raft out of logs. They used a hatchet, and it was, must have been a lot of work, in the, and considering how cold it was, it probably wasn't a pleasant task. They get out on the river. There's lots of ice and chunks of ice churning in the river, and as they're going, they're trying to get to the other side, and they can't, so Washington puts a pole out to try and push themselves to the side. The ice buffets it and flings him into the icy water of the Allegheny River. He grabs onto the raft and they head into this little island. Today it's called Hare Island. It's right almost downtown Pittsburgh. At the time there was nothing there, and they spent the night there. There is a modern marker marking the place where Washington and Gist spent the night on this island, and then they finally get to Shanapin's town because the river froze over solid. They were able to walk across it. So in less than two days, Washington has escaped death twice, once at the hands of the Indian, another time in this icy river. He could have easily frozen to death or died that night from hypothermia. It's amazing he, he survived it. Finally, on January 16th, Washington returns to Williamsburg and delivers the French response to Governor Dinwiddie. In his journal, Washington describes this whole trek to the, for, uh, to the French and back as fatiguing a journey as it is possible to conceive, 
rendered so by excessive bad weather. From the first day of December till the 15th, there was but one day but that it rained or snowed incessantly, and throughout the whole journey we met with nothing but one continued series of cold, wet weather, which occasioned very uncomfortable lodgings, especially after we had left our tent, which was some screen from the inclemency of it. After his return to Williamsburg, Washington enjoys kind of a moment of fame. He wrote out his journal and his notes, and Governor Dinwiddie published them, and the idea behind this was to create public support for the effort to expel the French from the backcountry, which would then put pressure on the House of Burgesses, which was the colonial legislature for Virginia, to appropriate more funds to raise more troops and so forth. Not only this, Dinwiddie had also been sending reports back to London, so now Washington's name is becoming known to important and powerful people back in London in the government. And there were also newspaper accounts of the trek through the wilderness and the message to the French as well. It was during this time that Washington got his first taste, I think, of what politics is like. There were members in the House of Burgesses during the discussions who felt that Washington's trek to the French was really just part of a scheme to promote the interests of the Ohio Company, which we talked about earlier, because he was connected to that. And so was Dinwiddie, the governor. He also got a ringside seat as to what happens when the executive and the legislative body of a government clash because Dinwiddie's wanting the legislature to raise more money for defense and for militia and more troops and the the House of Burgesses isn't willing to vote for as much as he wants. On March 15, 1754, young Washington was promoted to lieutenant colonel and he became part of a force that the governor wanted to go back up and their assignment was to protect the workers that had already been sent up to build the British fort at the forks of the river because controlling that forks where the Ohio River starts is critical to controlling the backcountry. So as Washington and his small army move out, head back up to that way, they stop at some of the towns and they're commandeering supplies, especially wagons. Back then you had to have wagons if you intended to feed your army and plus you needed it to carry your artillery, your gunpowder, everything the army needed. The tents had to be carried by wagons and wagons were seemed like they were always in short supply. He resorted to commandeering at some point which meant that the army would just simply take what it needed, give you a receipt, and you could request payment for it later from the government. This irritated locals to the point where one of the counties actually issued an arrest warrant against Washington. Here he is, the commander of this force, and the sheriff was actually going to try and arrest him, but there was really no way to do that since Washington had an army with him. They couldn't just come and arrest him. But it kind of, I think, gave him, again, another further lesson in how politics works and how civil power works, etc. He was getting a lot of lessons in his early 20s here. So Washington and his force head up towards the forks, and unfortunately for him, the French, with a large force of French and Indians, had come down, kicked out the English, took over the site, and they were building a fort that they called Fort Duquesne. So Washington had to just kind of step aside. He didn't have enough men to contest this, so he just simply moved back down. You can see on the map there, a little ways south of the forks, where Fort Duquesne is, Washington built Fort Necessity. And from here, he could keep an eye on the French and their activities, or at least get in their way a little bit. So while Washington is toiling away, him and his men building Fort Necessity, which was kind of a crude little fort, he gets word from some of his Indian scouts that there's a party of French and Indians heading his direction. So Washington takes a group of his militia and and some Indians and heads north to intercept them. On May 28, 1754, Washington and his men... They come upon the camp of the French and Indian uh, group of French and Indians. They're in a little small glen or valley. They just had breakfast. They're not aware Washington and his men are there. So Washington and his men kind of encircle them. And then what happened next has always been controversial, how the fighting actually started. Now, some new sources have come to light that indicate that Washington was the one that ordered the firing, which seems kind of reckless if you think about it. Anyway, during the skirmish, the French, of course, being not prepared in this little valley, most of them are killed. But one of them ran off. He escaped. And there's a story that goes that the half-king, the guy that I mentioned earlier, he was, a, he was an Indian chieftain. He was with Washington. He ran forward and tomahawked the French commander in the head who had been wounded and then washed his hands in this in this guy's brains. The, the French commander's name was Jumonville. Now, Washington, of course, took the position that these guys were spies, that they were trying to spy on the British. And the French insisted instead that they were a diplomatic mission coming to bring messages to the governor of Virginia. So the issue became kind of murky at that point. This really is considered the skirmish that starts the war, the French and Indian War. After the skirmish was over, Washington's Indians busily set about scalping the dead. In a letter written to his brother a few days later, Washington penned one of the most famous sayings that would be attributed to him of maybe any other saying. He says, 
I can with truth assure you, I heard the bullets whistle, and believe me, there was something charming in the sound. Somehow this comment found its way into the London press, and King George II, who was not impressed, and now had to worry about a major war with a very powerful enemy, commented, He would not say so if he had been used to hear many. After the skirmish at Jumonville Glen has come to be known, and truly if it really was Washington that started the skirmish, it was more of a massacre. After these incidents, the French now felt they needed to take a firmer hand in removing the British from the back country. So on July 3, 1754, a large force of French and Indians attacked Fort Necessity. The fort was not very strong. It was circular shaped. It was made of logs set into the ground. If you listen to my earlier podcast about fortifications in the colonial period, you get an idea of what it was like. And it had some shallow trenches built around it. And it was also built in a, in a low spot, which is kind of not a good place to build a fort. You always want to put it on a hill and clear all the trees around it. And Washington didn't do that. He built it near some, some woods so they would have a, a nearby source of timber which kind of made it vulnerable to attack. So in a pouring rain, the French, who had who had advantage in numbers, attacked this fort. And after some fighting, I think Washington knew this was not going to go well. The French offered him the chance to surrender. And they used kind of a strategy. They told him, hey, uh, we've got more Indians coming. We're not going to be able to control them if you guys don't surrender. So you might want to think about that soon. Little did Washington know the French were actually close to being out of ammunition. And I've often wondered... If they had continued to fight and the French ran out of ammunition and had to leave, how different things would have been through the rest of the war in the back country. Nevertheless, Washington, not knowing that, he could see that the end was near. And he was fearful, too, that his men would be be killed and scalped by the Indians, the French Indians. So he agreed to surrender. And in the surrender document, and this is really important, which was written in French, Washington signed it, not really understanding that he was agreeing that he had assassinated Jumonville. So this gave the French the excuse to say, see, you assassinated a diplomat. This defeat at Fort Necessity was deeply humiliating personally to Washington, but also to the whole English empire. The French had effectively kicked them out of the Ohio back country, and it reverberated throughout the empire. Powerful people in London began to have negative things to say about Washington. The Earl of Albemarle commented, Washington and many such may have courage and resolution, but they have no knowledge or experience in our profession. Consequently, there can be no dependence on them. Officers and good ones must be sent to discipline the militia and to lead them on as this nation. We may then, and not before, drive the French back to their settlements. The Duke of Newcastle made this comment, All North America will be lost if these practices are tolerated, and no war can be worse in this country than the suffering of such insults as these. So there's, there was this feeling that Washington had been incompetent and that there needed to be more done by the British government to drive the French out of the back country. The situation was also embarrassing to Governor Dinwiddie, and when Washington got back to Williamsburg, he was informed by the governor that the army was going to be reorganized into 10 companies, each commanded by a captain, and Washington was offered command of one of them, but with a demotion and rank to captain, and Washington just simply refused to do it. He, he resigned instead. He had often threatened to resign in his letters to Dinwiddie over such things as pay and other conditions, but this time he actually did it. In 1755, the British government decided to take things in North America a little more seriously, and they sent over General Braddock with one of the largest armies ever assembled under the British flag in North America. The goal that General Braddock had was that he was to conquer Fort Duquesne and eject the French from the Ohio country. Despite Washington's bitterness over what had happened with Fort Necessity and the defeat there and his demotion and his decision to leave military life, it seems as though he couldn't leave military life alone. He uh, contacted General Braddock, and Braddock was anxious to have Washington on his staff, since Washington probably had more experience in the backcountry than anyone else. And Washington was made a civilian aide without rank to General Braddock. He became one of Braddock's aide-de-camp. So that put Washington in Braddock's inner circle. It's interesting that Washington doesn't seem to be able to leave the allure of a military life. I think he saw a victory and being part of the military as bringing him glory and fame and perhaps elevating his reputation. Perhaps also he was trying to imitate his brother, his his older dead brother Lawrence, who had had a a somewhat successful military life down in the Caribbean during uh, King George's War. Washington seemed to enjoy being part of Braddock's inner circle, the, quote, family, as he called it. In fact, in a letter to his mother, he wrote, I am very happy in the general's family, as I am treated with a complacent freedom, which is quite agreeable, so that I have no reason to doubt the satisfaction I proposed in making the campaign. 
Perhaps more importantly, though, were the disagreements. Braddock didn't have particularly a high opinion of the colonies or of their leaders, and he complained bitterly about it, and with some justifiable reason. But apparently he got into arguments with Washington about this. Washington wrote to his friend William Fairfax. He said, The general, by frequent breaches of contracts, has lost all degree of patience, and will, I fear, represent us home, meaning to England, in a light we little deserve. For instead of blaming the individuals as he ought, he charges all his disappointments to a public supineness, and looks upon the colonies, I believe, as void of both honor and honesty. We have frequent disputes on this head, which are maintained with warmth on both sides, especially on his, who is incapable of arguing without or giving up any point he asserts, be it ever so incompatible with reason. This may have been one of the first tastes that Washington had of royal officials and their bad attitude towards the colonists. And it might have been an influence later on him when he decided to join the American Revolution and cause of independence against England. Because I don't think he liked being looked down upon. None of the colonial upper crust did. One of the reasons that Braddock wanted Washington on this expedition was because Washington had experience in the back country. And some of the advice that Washington gave to Braddock included being aware of Indian battle tactics in the forests and also about the necessity of using pack animals instead of wagons. Wagons can carry a lot more than a pack animal, but they're very hard to get over those horrible roads. And so he, he recommended to Braddock that they get pack animals and load them up with the supplies and gear instead of wagons. Braddock's march was not an easy one because not only were they marching towards Fort Duquesne, but they were also building a road as they went. This meant chopping down a lot of trees. It meant leveling the ground. It meant removing boulders and even blasting out rocks when needed to level the road or to remove big, big rocks or obstructions. The baggage train alone for Braddock's army was three to four miles long. So this army with several thousand troops as well as the baggage wagons must have stretched out for some considerable distance out in the wilderness. And there's accounts of them not only eating their rations, but also living on bear meat and rattlesnake on occasion. Sometime during the middle of June or late in June, Washington became very sick with what they called the bloody flux. Now today we know this is dysentery. And judging from his descriptions of what happened in his letters to his brother, he seemed to be quite ill to the point where he couldn't even ride. So they put him in the back of a wagon and he's jostling along. It couldn't have been a happy experience. It had to be quite miserable to be that sick and be in the back of a wagon jostling over a primitive road. General Braddock ordered his doctors to give Washington some medicine, which he said seemed to help him quite a bit. But one of the things that Washington was really worried about was whether or not he would be able to be involved or participate in this battle, this attack on Fort Duquesne. He badly wanted to be in that battle, maybe regain some glory or if not revenge for what had happened to him. In a letter to his brother on this subject, Washington wrote, the general giving me his word and honor that I should be brought up before he reached the French fort, this promise and the doctor's threat that if I persevered, it would endanger my life, determined my halting. On the screen right now is a map, and it shows the area where the Battle of the Monongahela occurred. In order to get to Fort Duquesne, Braddock's army would have to cross the Monongahela River twice. And this map shows the army as it's just crossed the second time across the Monongahela River. This exact spot is in the modern town of Braddock. And if you look at the left side of the screen, you can see where I've marked 6th Street. That's where the currently in the town of Braddock 6th Street runs. This is about seven miles from downtown Pittsburgh, approximately. You can see in the map the, the little red blocks. Those are the British troops marching up the new road that they're making. And on the left is Lieutenant Colonel Gage. He's kind of the red arrow. Gage would later become an important person. He would be commander-in-chief of the British forces when the American Revolution started. How ironic it is that he and George Washington at this time were in the same army. Gage was at the very front. He and his grenadiers, which were pretty tough troops, were kind of guarding the pioneers, as they were called. These are the guys that were chopping down the trees and building the road. So he's guarding them as they're building the road. In about the center of the British column, you can see the one block that has the white square in it. That's approximately the place where Braddock was and presumably where Washington was when they ran into the French. There were a lot of wagons within the British column here. And in fact, two, two men that were driving wagons would later become very famous Americans. One of them was Daniel Boone and the other was Daniel Morgan. They were there that day too. The dots around the British column represent the flanking guards or troops that Braddock had sent out to try and act as feelers to prevent surprise flank attacks. Right after the British crossed the Monongahela River, they had to pass through a ravine. You can see it there's the dark greenish line, kind of where uh, Braddock is. And there was a second ravine 
right where Gage is, kind of where 6th Street runs today. And that's where Gage, at, right in the vanguard, runs into the French and Indian Army that's headed their way, which is represented by the Blue Box. The majority of the French force was made up of Indians, and as soon as the fighting started, they quickly spread out onto the flanks of the British, which is represented in this map by the, the blue lines that are coming into the British flanks on both sides. Upon hearing the firing, Braddock headed up to the front of the line to see what was happening, and he kept trying to get his men to form up in order of battle, which was what they would do in a European battlefield. And they're out in the open, more or less, because they're in this road area that's got all the trees chopped down, and the Indians are firing at them from behind trees and from under cover, and they can't see who's firing at them often. They just see themselves getting shot at and killed. The British were suffering some pretty high casualties. So as Braddock is doing this, he himself gets shot, and Washington comes up and helps carry him off. Both not only Braddock, but also his other aide-de-camps are shot, except for Washington. He's the only one of Braddock's command that remained unwounded, and so he kind of takes over command in a way. And by this time, the British troops are in a state of panic. They're running backwards in upon themselves. Troops are rushing forward, running into guys that are fleeing in panic. One of the things that frightens a lot of the men that you read in some of the journals was the Indian war cries, these loud, piercing cries terrified many of them. Washington kind of takes command of the situation and helps get the men out in an orderly retreat. He kind of salvages what's left of Braddock's army. Not only Washington, but it's colonial troops that are kind of covering the retreat in the back, helping them escape. But I think one of the things that really saved the British from further damage, now the British outnumbered the French force considerably here, but they were in a state of panic and in a bad tactical situation. But I think one of the things that helped save them was that the Indians were stopping to scalp the dead or the dying, and they also stopped to plunder the wagons the British had, in their panic, had left behind. There was ammunition, there were guns, there were supplies, there was liquor, everything they wanted, so they stopped to plunder all that. In letters to both Governor Dinwiddie and to his own brother, Washington reported having four bullet holes in his coat and two horses shot out from under him, and yet he himself was never hit. And he attributed his survival to, quote, the miraculous care of providence. This was a huge disaster for the British military, one of the biggest they'd ever suffered. And one of the ironies is, is that the colonial troops, the militia that was normally looked down upon, actually gained some favorable press coverage, even in England. In fact, George Washington's uncle, Joseph Ball, wrote, We have heard of General Braddock's defeat. Everybody blames his rash conduct. Everybody commends the courage of the Virginians and the Carolina men. Those were the colonial troops that Washington had helped uh, cover the retreat and protect them from the attacking Indians and French. So Washington is now kind of seen as a hero who's been protected by providence, the hand of God, for possibly some greater future work. One preacher who was giving a sermon said this about him. He said, I cannot but hope that providence has hitherto preserved Colonel Washington in so signal a manner for some important service to his country. Christopher Gist, who had accompanied Washington on that painful and exhausting journey to the French to deliver the message, made this comment to him. He said, your name is more talked of in Pennsylvania than any other person in the army. Back in London, Lord Halifax said, who is Mr. Washington? I know nothing of him, but they say that he behaved in Braddock's action as, bra as bravely as if he really loved the whistling of bullets. And the powerful Duke of Newcastle back in London also wrote, Now we must employ Americans to fight Americans. So there seemed to be some realization that the colonial troops and their leaders weren't so bad after all. About a month after the battle, Washington was promoted to full colonel by Governor Dinwiddie. In the commission, it says, Your loyalty, courage, and good conduct do by these presents appoint you colonel of the Virginia Regiment and commander-in-chief of all the forces now raised and to be raised for the defense of his majesty's colony and for the repelling the unjust and hostile invasions of the French and their Indian allies. And you are hereby charged with full power and authority to act defensively and offensively as you shall think for the good and welfare of the service. So things had come kind of full circle for Washington. He went from being disliked from Dinwiddie for what happened at Fort Necessity and being looked down upon now to being kind of a hero who was preserved by God for some great purpose in the future. And even Dinwiddie now had promoted him to full colonel and made him commander-in-chief of all the forces in Virginia. All right, on the screen right now is a map that kind of shows what Washington was doing in the next phase after he had become the hero at Braddock's defeat, the Battle of the Monongahela, he returns back down to Virginia. He's been made a full colonel now and commander-in-chief of the Virginia forces. And between August 1755 through June of 1758, he's charged with the task of trying to defend this huge frontier. 
And this is really a frustrating, impossible task. I think these next three years, despite being fully vindicated and being seen as a hero, he's got this frustrating task of trying to defend this frontier. The red kind of shaded area shows the area where the French and Indians were doing a lot of their raiding, and he really had no power to stop it. And it was all being staged and sponsored out of Fort Duquesne. The French were supplying the Indians, they were keeping them going and so forth. And that was a very frustrating thing to him that they couldn't stop it. And this is kind of a huge uh, burden or responsibility for someone who's still as young as he was. He was in his early and mid-20s. In one of his letters to Governor Dinwiddie, you can hear his frustration. He says, I mentioned in my last to your honor that I did not think less than 2,000 men would be sufficient to defend our extensive and much exposed frontiers from the ravages of the enemy. In another letter, he wrote, I have been posted then for 20 months past upon our cold and barren frontiers to perform, I think I may say, impossibilities, that is, to protect from the cruel incursions of a crafty savage enemy a line of inhabitants of more than 350 miles extent with a force inadequate to the task. By this mean I am become in a manner an exile and seldom informed of these opportunities which I might otherwise embrace corresponding with my friends. Experience, sir, has convinced every thinking man in this colony that we must bid adieu to peace and safety whilst the French are allowed to possess the Ohio. So it doesn't, not only does Washington not have enough men to try and defend this frontier, they're not the best quality, many of them, in addition to being too few. As frustrating as the situation was, I think Washington was getting some life's lessons that would prove to be invaluable later in what he would do as commander-in-chief of the Continental Army and later as president of the United States. I want to list off a few things that he experienced that I think prepared him well for what he would do later. For example, supplies. He was always struggling to keep his army supplied during this time, and this would be a constant problem while he was commander-in-chief of the Continental Army, just trying to keep his men supplied and fed. He learned the impossibility also of relying upon militia troops. During the Revolutionary War, militia were used throughout the war, but they were not reliable. And he learned this during these campaigns. A lot of the militia were deserting, uh, had high desertion rates, they were undependable in battle. In fact, he got so tired of the desertions that he built the gallows in the fort, and he actually hanged some of these guys that were deserting. And he later came to see discipline as the soul of the army. I think that was the wording he used. Another thing he complained about was the lack of unity among the colonies. The colonies collectively had quite a bit of resources they could have used. They probably could have dislodged the French from the back country and bought off the Indians the way the French were if they'd all gotten together. But back then, each colony was kind of like its own country and it didn't want to help the others if it didn't have to. In a letter to a friend, he wrote that the, the French would be able to give a final stab to liberty and property if the colonies continue in their fatal lethargy. He went on to write, Nothing I more sincerely wish than a union of the colonies in this time of imminent danger. So maybe long before the colonies uh, coalesced into one country, he was thinking how important it would be to have a, a united country. Washington, during this time, also learned the necessity of being able to effectively cooperate with and get the Indians to side with you. He wrote, Indians are the only match for Indians, and without these we shall ever fight upon equal terms. Their cunning is only to be equaled by that of the fox, and like them they seize their prey by stealth. The colonial governments had been working with the Cherokee and Catawba Indians, and they actually assembled raiding parties, the Cherokee and Catawba. They would go to Virginia, and of course they were expecting to be given presents. In effect, you could buy them as mercenaries is what this amounted to. And there were none to give them, and Washington would complain bitterly to the governor, hey, where's the things we promised these Indians? They're not going to fight for us if we don't give them something. So that was another thing he learned. Another important lesson that Washington learned during this time was learning how to handle criticism. Even though he'd come back as a hero from Braddock's disaster, he was still being criticized for not being able to defend the frontier, which really wasn't his fault. But he was sometimes being blamed for it because he was the person responsible for trying to do it. And it was during this time, I think, that he learned to just ignore criticism, even though it made him angry. He did that a lot as president. He would simply ignore criticisms or charges made against him. Another important lesson that Washington learned this time that he would roll forward later as commander-in-chief of the Continental Army is the impossibility of being effective as a military leader when you don't have political support. And he also kept his avenues of political support open. Of course, Governor Dinwiddie was his immediate superior, but he also found ways around Dinwiddie. He often corresponded with uh, Speaker Robinson, who was Speaker of the House of Burgesses, and he also worked through the Fairfaxes, who were probably one of the most powerful families in Virginia at this time. During this time, one of the things that frustrated Washington 
maybe more than anything else, was the British policy that any time an officer in the regular British Army was present, he had seniority above the highest ranking colonial militia officer. So even though Washington was a colonel, he was subject to the newest, greenest lieutenant in the regular British Army. This irritated him greatly, and he tried throughout the war to get the situation fixed, or at least to get himself a commission in the regular British Army so he wouldn't have this problem. In one of his letters to Governor Dinwiddie, you can see his frustration with this overflowing. He says, We cannot conceive that being Americans should deprive us of the benefits of British subjects, nor lessen our claims to preferment. We are defending the king's dominions, and although, although the inhabitants of Great Britain are removed from this danger, they are not yet equally with us concerned and interested in the fate of the country. And there can be no sufficient reason given why we, who spend our blood and treasure in defense of this country, are not entitled to equal preferment. It's been a huge source of of speculation as to what would have happened had George Washington actually been able to obtain a officer's commission in the regular British Army instead of just being in the militia. If that had happened, would he have been willing to side with the rebels during the American Revolution? Would he have sided with independence or would he have then felt like he had to be loyal to the king? That's an interesting question that I don't know that anyone can really ever answer, but it's certainly interesting. Washington's letters during this time, both to Governor Dinwiddie and to friends, are laced with threats to resign his commission. You can see he's just so frustrated with the situation. But his friends were advising him not to do so. One of his friends, Landon Carter, emphasized to him not to resign. He said, no, sir, rather let Braddock's bed be your aim than anything that might discolor those laurels that I promised myself are kept in store for you. Landon's brother, Charles Carter, wrote, Whenever you are mentioned in the House of Burgesses, tis with the greatest respect I hope you will therefore arm yourself with patience and despise such reflections as may be cast by any malevolent enemies to you. And his own brother told him, you know, if you resign at this point, you'll be more dishonorable than if you simply keep fighting and persevering and perhaps don't do as well as you could. It'll just look worse to resign than keep trying. So Washington decided to hang in there. By 1758, the British had decided to commit serious resources in defeating the French in North America. This included a fresh expedition against Fort Duquesne, this time led by General Forbes. Forbes wanted Washington on the expedition for the same reasons Braddock had wanted Washington. Washington had just about more experience than any other officer had had in this back country, and they thought that would be helpful. Forbes decided to build a new road to Fort Duquesne. You can see it on the map on the screen there. The red line shows Braddock's Road, where that went. That began down in Virginia and went through Maryland, whereas Forbes's road would stay entirely within Pennsylvania. This new road frustrated Washington. He complained about it. He was angry. He felt that the Pennsylvanians had persuaded Forbes and that the old road that Braddock had cut would be a better route. And Forbes was pretty angry that Washington got involved in this and actually scolded him for it. During the Forbes expedition, Washington was involved in a friendly fire incident that continued to reinforce the idea that he was being protected by Providence for some future reason. The French and Indians had attacked the British, and Forbes sent out Washington and some other officers with men out to try and and drive off the French and Indians. And in the darkness, the troops began firing on each other, thinking each other was the enemy. Washington rode up and down the lines with his sword, hitting the men's muskets up so they couldn't fire at each other, and he was never hit by any bullets. And so this, again, was seen as another possible act of divine providence protecting this young Washington. The French were unable to maintain their Indian allies in western Pennsylvania. They couldn't bring the gifts for them that they had at the beginning of the war, the presents to buy them, because the Indians were essentially like mercenaries. They'd fight for whichever side would give them the most. And the war was going badly for the French up in Canada. So the French, as, as Forbes's expedition got closer to Fort Duquesne, the French ended up destroying it and abandoning it. And the advance parties of Forbes's army arrived at Fort Duquesne to find the smoldering, smoking ruins that had been blown up just a few hours before they arrived there, late in November in 1758. I think Washington was disappointed that there was no battle. I think he wanted not only revenge, but he also wanted to have some kind of glorious act of military heroism. Glory on the battlefield was one of the greatest honors you could have in his world, and he was denied this again. Before ending this podcast, I want to talk about something that was going on in the background of Washington's life during the French and Indian War. And these are the three important women in his life that I want to talk about. We'll say more about them in future podcasts. But I think it'd be good idea just to mention a few things about them now. The first of these three women I want to talk about was his mother, Mary Ball. 
Washington and his mother had somewhat of a strained relationship. She's a little bit clinging, and nothing that he ever did was really ever good enough. She was always accusing him of neglecting her, and she even did so in public forums, which caused him a great deal of embarrassment. You can tell that their relationship is not very close by the letters he sends to her. His letters to her are formal, they're respectful, they're dutiful, but they're never warm or affectionate. Interestingly, on Washington's many trips down to Williamsburg to meet with Dinwiddie, or the House of Burgesses, Fredericksburg, where his mother lived on Ferry Farm, it was called Ferry Farm, that was her plantation, it was right on the way to Williamsburg, but he often would not go visit. He didn't want to have these confrontations. He tried to avoid her on some occasions, it sounds like. The second of these three women I want to talk about is Martha Dandridge Custis. She later married George Washington and became Martha Washington. Later in life, Martha burned all the personal correspondence between she and George, and so we don't know a lot about how they first met or how things went. We do know that he met with her a couple of times in March of 1758, and this is just before he took off on the Forbes expedition. She was a wealthy widow. She had two children by her her deceased husband. And he ended up marrying her on January 6, 1759, just after the Forbes expedition ended. In one letter, he described her as his, quote, agreeable consort for life. We'll have more to say about Martha in future podcasts. The third and last woman I want to mention in in Washington's life at this time, and the one that's in many ways the most interesting, is Sarah Carey Fairfax, sometimes just called Sally Fairfax. Now, Washington, at least judging from the things he said in his letters, was deeply infatuated, maybe even in love with her. But the problem was that she was married to George William Fairfax, who was a very close friend of Washington and one of his important supporters and patrons. His letters to Sally Fairfax, unlike the ones that to his mother, which are kind of cold and distant, his letters to Sally Fairfax are full of emotion and even passion. We don't often associate Washington with passion. He looks so stern and distant and cold on the $1 bill, but he really was very passionate about her. There's one particular letter that Washington wrote to, to Sarah Carey Fairfax on September 12th, 1758. So this is, he's right in the midst of the Forbes campaign, but from the, his tent, he writes this letter to her. He never comes out directly and tells her how much he loves her. Rather, he does it in kind of roundabout ways. For example, in one part of the letter, he says, If you allow that any honor can be derived from my opposition to our present system of management, You destroy the merit of it entirely in me by attributing my anxiety to the animating prospect of possessing Mrs. Custis. And Mrs. Custis, of course, is Martha. A couple of sentences later, he writes, "'Tis true I profess myself a votary to love. I acknowledge that a lady is in the case, and further I confess that this lady is known to you. Yes, madam, as well as she is to one who is too sensible of her charms to deny the power, his influence he, meaning himself, feels and must ever submit to. I feel the force of her amiable beauties in the recollection of a thousand tender passages that I could wish to obliterate till I am bid to revive them. But experience, alas, sadly reminds me how impossible this is and evinces an opinion which I have long entertained that there is a destiny which has the sovereign control of our actions, not to be resisted by the strongest efforts of human nature. So, and keep in mind that this letter was just a few months before he marries Martha. For further information on this subject, I recommend the following books. George Washington, Writings, edited by John Rodehamel. Young Washington, How Wilderness and War Forged America's Founding Father, by Peter Stark. George Washington's Diaries, An Abridgment, edited by Dorothy Tuig. George Washington, The Forge of Experience, 1732-1775, by James Thomas Flexner. Colonial Pennsylvania, A History, by Joseph E. Illick. And The Center of Our Union, George Washington's Political Philosophy and the Creation of American National Identity in the 1790s. Unpublished Ph.D. dissertation written by Ryan Stoudy.